Hey, hey, good evening, guys. <laughs> yes, it's evening. And um, I just would like to uh, welcome you guys to this is now I am starting my seventh year. I've had six full years in. I, I joined or started my YouTube channel back in March of 2016 and got over 200 videos. Um, not many hunting. There's only maybe about three or four or five at most a year on hunting and the rest of them are all fly fishing. Okay, and what this started out was just a little This was just a little project of I don't know just I just wanted to fool around and um, Kind of how I got into this and I don't know if I explained it in one of my other videos my boys used to race motocross for eight years and um, they used to have GoPros on their helmets. And once they got done and went to college, dad said I wasn't paying for their fun anymore. <laughs> it's because I'm paying for college. And um, so we had GoPros sitting around. And actually my son made a video from just a local stream right down the street from us. And it was on a dry fly. He was only at the time, boy, I don't know at the time my older son went to college first obviously but I think my younger son might have been about 12 13 years old and um, he went down made a little video with the first GoPros we had of a fish taking a dry fly and I think well heck if he can do it I can do it <laughs> so <laughs> so we just started out that way just kind of wanting to just fool around get some some of my tr fishing trips on film and Maybe have them for my kids or my grandkids when I got older and couldn't get on the stream anymore. And, you know, after it kind of went from there, got some decent feedback and just grew, 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 grew. And now it is what it is now, uh, today. So I still just let you guys know I do not monetize any of my videos. I know there's commercials that come on, but those commercials are put on by YouTube, not by me. I don't make a single dime on any of my videos. So... So now I, you know, I did have back, I think in 2000, New Year's of 2000, I did have one tips video. If you ever wanted to go back and check out that, that tip video, uh, that was more a general uh, fly time. But like, that covered a lot of stuff too. And th this will cover it, cover everything, but, the, but I'm going to explain more what I do before I go out on the stream. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit my technique. I am not, I encourage everybody to go out there and try whatever technique they are most comfortable and successful with. And when, whatever you find out which one you're going to choose, use it, practice it, get proficient with it, and you'll enjoy yourself a lot more. Don't be jumping around, uh, you know, once you've given other methods or styles a try then and give them all a fair try i do you know encourage that give them all a fair try whatever you think is a fair try and then pick which one you know is yours and get proficient with it get good i like the idea of keeping everything simple and my whole technique is simple and what i use my material is all simple the last thing i'm doing going to discuss in this tips video or I don't know how I want to call it but call it tips and uh, is just equipment because the, the equipment is honestly I'm not going to say the least important thing but basically you can use whatever fly rod you want and if you're good enough you can still use it and adapt to it and you're still going to catch fish certain equipment makes it more comfortable helps but it definitely is not needed and you don't need real expensive equipment you know yes i have some expensive stuff i have some moderate stuff i have some cheap stuff but you know okay i'm older i've been doing this 45 plus years i'm i'm gonna be 59 i started when i was 10 years old so almost 50 years i've been if it been doing this okay and so coming from you know my background my experiences my putting out all these videos over the years i i think i could 
come up, you know, and, and give people some advice, okay? And so that's basically what this is. So um, I got a whole list here that I'm going to outline that I'm going to follow. And um, so I'm going to be looking over at it every now and then, okay? But I'm going to start, like I said, as, as far as what I do beforehand before I even go out on the stream. Now, I said in a lot of my videos that um, I, I just work weekends. So I have off Monday through Friday. But that makes it a very good schedule for me to go out and hit streams because they are pounded on the weekend obviously more guys off on the weekend and but i also like not to fish so much on mondays i will go out mondays if i don't have a choice or how the weather falls or the flows but you know if i have a choice and i can wait and everything is going to be kind of similar and and the weather's going to be good the flows are going to be good you know for, i i like to give the fish monday off after being pounded Saturday and Sunday, and that's just me in particular, but, you know, any weekdays, I think, is better than a weekend, just because of the crowds, okay? Now, um, let's see here. Uh, now, I'm going to start off first with a mindset of how to go out and how to approach the stream and how to fish, and the first thing is, you got to be positive. Even if you're a beginner, you have to be positive. You have to be, you, you, you're just defeating yourself going out with a negative attitude. Like, this is too hard. I can't do this. I'm not catching any fish. So first thing is try to at least have a positive outset. And I, one, I, I'm going to tell some stories here, but, you know, I, I, been, I'm just going to use the Delaware. I fished the Delaware. 30 years ago, okay? For about 10 years, I did it. And I had, I used to say back in some early videos, I had a love-hate relationship with it. I have a good day, have a bad day. Have a good day, have a bad day. And then I took a break when my boys got into the motocross. And and when they, then when they were little and when they got into the motocross. And then, uh, then about 15 years ago, I started going back up again. But more so... I really committed to figuring out that system about 10 years ago. And one of the best things of the mindset that I had up there, like I knew I was fishing for wild fish. There's wild brownies, wild rainbows up in the Delaware. But this thinking goes for any wild stream or any stock stream that also has wild fish in it. You have to fish that stream like there are fish everywhere. Wild fish will inhabit banks they will inhabit the skinniest water not so much with stockfish because you know they're just stock there they don't know the stream as well they like to stay in schools you know they don't travel too far from the bucket you know until you get a couple months out but um but you have to have a positive uh outlook and you have to fish everywhere that was one of my biggest uh, game changers when I started fishing the Delaware was I fished like there was fish everywhere beforehand before you know when I first went up my first 10 or 15 years it was um, I just uh, you know kind of cherry picked and went to the honey holes and went back to where I last fished I didn't explore much and it changed so much differently when I started so much differently when I started fishing shallow rifts when I started fishing going out towards the middle of the river and fishing towards the bank and um, traveling just traveling finding new spots parking in other areas walking train tracks walking banks and I, I don't I can't say that there's any secret up at the Delaware because the guys who floating it know every inch of it but for guys who wade it they you know if you you're limiting yourself if you don't explore outside of the easy access areas, okay? You got to hike a little. You got to explore a little. And, and and that goes with every stream, okay? That, not just up there, but the, my this is how my story relates as far as my mindset. And, you know, with fly fishing too, I guess it can go for all fishing, but more so, you know, I'm talking to fly fishermen, but you could have... 
a bad morning. You can have a bad two, three, four hours. You can have nothing going on, and then all of a sudden, a hatch comes off, something changes, the fish kick in, and you might catch 20 fish in the afternoon. And 20 fish on a whole day, or even 10 fish, 12 fish, whatever is better, it, it is a great day no matter where you go. So even though you're having a bad period, you never know what might kickstart those fish into, into feeding. So if you got time, I would say don't leave, hang out. There's things to learn on the stream. You could practice your casting, you could turn over rocks, you can just keep fishing. But if you have the time, stay on the stream, learn, practice, and you'd be surprised at what happens just giving, giving the stream time and and just whether even if it's dead of winter sometimes just the fish kick in they start feeding it might only be for an hour period but that hour period you could pick up a bunch of fish so you know you got to be positive and and one little story i'll tell you about and i did a video about a year year and a half ago i went up to the clarion river uh, first two three hours in the morning I only caught two or three fish and it was high and I just wasn't having a great time and that's a five hour trip for me and I I w stayed over two days and, I, and the first day it was still raining when I got there and uh, raining in the morning when I got up so I figured you know I only caught two or three fish it was like two three hours and I'm like, ah, this isn't just the best time to be up here. I, I sometimes I think, you know, uh, rain is good. And rain is good for the most part for fishing. But this particular trip, it wasn't. So I drove like an hour and a half back towards central PA. Because that's a little bit hitting the western side of PA. And I uh, stopped at Spring Creek. I did a video there. I didn't get there till two in the afternoon. I fished it from like maybe two to six, just for four hours. And I picked up like 30 fish. And that's like what can happen, not just on Spring Creek, but a lot of creeks, you know? So make the most of your time out there and go with a positive attitude. And at least you're starting off, you know, in the right direction on the right foot, okay? So now when I, and picking a day to go fishing. I don't, sometimes I wanna to go to a certain area, but it's not, I can very easily change my mind, okay? And sometimes while I'm driving <laughs> to the first place I think I'm going to, I still may change my mind. But I check out several creeks in the direction that I'm going. Or if I just have the day off and I don't know which direction I'm going, I might check out five or six creeks. So try to use most of the creeks, most of them, not all of them, have a USGS gauge. Pull up, type in USGS, uh, you know, Little Juniata, uh, West Branch of the Delaware, Pine Creek, you know, whatever, Penns Creek, whatever stream it is, most of the uh, bigger quality streams do have a USGS gauge on them. Now, not all of them have a, some of them have flow, some have flow and temperature. They just changed the USGS gauges, the format of it, and you kind of have to click in what you want because they'll give you the the feet and then they'll give you the, the, the uh, or they'll give it to you in, in feet and then cubic square feet per, or, or um, Oh, geez, like, oh, what the heck is it? Oh, the CFS is cubic feet per second. Or they'll give you the temperature in Fahrenheit or Celsius. So you, you can click and change for what, you know, for what, how you want to read it. And um, so go in, check those gauges. I, like most streams, I like them to be either around their median because there's even a click for the median level of that time period. I like them around the medium or a little bit higher. Um, so uh, if you have the choice to fish it higher, like after a rainstorm or uh, I like fishing actually the beginning of a rainstorm, not when it's hot and heavy during the middle of it, even though I've been caught in them and still had good fishing, but then I like it after a rainstorm as it's starting to recede and it's still dirty just 
after a rainstorm, a, a creek that's a little high and a little dirty, bringing down more biomass, those fish just get <laughs> in the feeding mode and they will feed and fish, uh, move around more in higher water. So, uh, like, if, I'm just going to give you an example. Like, I like, you know, let's say the little J at 250 to 350. But if it went up to five or 600 and now it's down to like 450 or 400, whew, I'll head out there because that's a great, as it's receding and it's still a little high, still a little dirty. Uh, whenever streams are like that, for me, I've always, um, uh, I've always done better on days like that. Um, so, uh, um, in here and and wind. Now obviously, you want to pick less windy days, but sometimes you don't have a choice. But if you have a choice, day before, day after, you know if conditions are going to be similar. But, I mean, you've seen some of my videos up on the Delaware, if you guys have been following me, and man, it's just howling, 20 mile an hour winds or more, and or less, but the fish are still biting. So if wind isn't that big of a factor for the fish feeding, but it does, less wind does make it way more comfortable, you know, for the fly fishermen. Um, uh, I told you about the receding flows. Now, time of day. Time of day, again, I'm going by everything you guys see in the videos. The old theory, and I'm going to tell you to throw this theory out the window. Don't even pay attention to guys or books back then that said, in the wintertime, best time to fish is, is the warmest time of the day, which is from 12 to 3. Well, that is not necessarily the best time to fish. I have almost... All my videos but I'm going to concentrate more or, or talk more about the winter time I'm hitting the water at 7 o'clock 7 30 8 o'clock in the morning sometimes my first cast I'm catching fish okay so fish when fish are feeding they're feeding and they're feeding and they're feeding at all times of the day not just 10 to 3 and I'm not even gonna say well it picks up from from uh, I mean 12 to 3 no I don't haven't I haven't seen that at all in all my years of fishing that it picks up from 12 to 3. If a bug comes off it's some type of activity it'll pick up but it does not pick up you know at a certain there if they're feeding they're feeding and a lot of times they feed more so at night and they're still in that stronger feeding mode in the morning so sometimes it's better in the morning and as far as time is day even in the winter time, a lot of times at the end of the day, there will be a midge hatch that comes off at the last hour, even half hour of the day. I've had it happen to me plenty of times where a midge hatch comes off. Why it comes off that late, I, I don't know. Now in the summertime, I like fishing sometimes a half an hour before the sun comes up and again, half an hour after the sun goes down or if it's towards evening, fish until the fish stop feeding if you could stay out there till last year on the delaware i was catching fish nine o'clock at night and it was pitch dark and there was still fish feeding dimpling for spinners so hey if you got the time and you know the water and you're still comfortable out there and you can hopefully sometimes you can fish by the moonlight and see the glare of the moonlight on the water so that works for you too and um and have you guys seen me do this in videos, but uh, when I get to the stream also, and I don't know the stream, turnover rocks. Turnover rocks, they're definitely not saying they're going to guarantee a fish, but they at least turning over numerous rocks, seeing what's there will at least get you in the ballpark. So turn over those rocks, okay? And... And... As far as the flows go, no. Uh, if you're going to a new area, you got to learn how to read water. And read water in some of my video, videos, like my last video, I was saying I was watching the shelves. You got to learn to be able to read skinny water, braided water. Braided water can still be, you know, a foot to two and a half feet deep, where it's nice, soft ripples you know, for a, some distance and it looks like they call it braids. And then you have faster, slow water that still has a good flow to it, that you might call a glide. 
and then you have your flat glassy water. But learning to read those waters and learning to read seams, uh, you're learning to read areas where fish will stage. And because fish, you know, look for the best feeding spots where food's going to come down. So anywhere you see a slightly faster flow, a seam there, that will bring more junk, more food, more biomass down that the fish will look and inspect and and uh, those are the areas you want to fish and focus on. Um, uh, when a hard, shallow rift gets a little softer, then gets even a little softer, those are little shelves and the fish will stage right near those shelves and as it drops a little deeper, shoot, they come and pick up the bugs as they come down those, as they roll over those shelves uh, or drop offs. So learn how to read the water and that doesn't mean you, you, you need, uh, I'm not saying look into the water like with sunglasses, I'm saying just to read the surface of the surface of the water can tell you a lot about the structure underneath. It can also not tell you a lot because it, it could be deceiving. But most of the time, it'll give you some idea of the structure underneath. And if you have ripply, more like ripply water, that means there's stones or something in there that's making it ripple like that, which fish love structure and hanging around structure. So learn how to read the structure when you go into streams. Um, now, uh, Okay, as far as water temps again, when I'm looking, I when I'm looking at the USGS gauge, if they have temps, uh, I said this on one of my Lehigh videos from this year, a month ago or two two months ago, that I was either going to go to the Tully or go to the Little Lehigh, and they both had good flows, but over the past three or four days, the flow, the temperatures were dropping on the Tully where it was just the opposite a little Lehigh. They both had temperature gauges on their, their temperature uh, readings on their USGS gauges. And it was just the opposite, it was climbing every day. So to me, that was a no brainer. I'm going to a stream where it's getting a little bit warmer uh, in the winter time, because that'll spark fish feeding activity, okay? And fish, like I said, fish have to eat. As far as temperatures go, the one thing that does, does slow temp, uh, the fishes, I don't know if I want to say their metabolism or just their behavior, is a drop in temperature, a drop in water temperature. Now, let's just say the water temperature is 40 and it drops down to 36 or 37, okay? Those fish will shut down for 24 to 48 hours, but if that, I won't even say 48, we'll say 24 four to 36 hours, okay? If that uh, temperature stays stable and you're into the second and third day and it's 30, 70, their feeding habits will kick right back on again. They'll resume their normal winter time feeding habits, not their normal feeding habits because they have winter feeding habits and they have summer feeding habits, but they have to eat. So if you see stable temps, even though there's a drop, I won't fish a stream if I see the, the, the first day or maybe even uh, a day and a half, like I said, or, or you know, that, that, the water, that the, the, there was a drop in water temperature. But if you we're going in, we're at the end of the second day and we're going into the third day, oh yeah, I'll go out there. Those fish should, be, should start feeding up again. They're, they'll get used to that temperature and they'll need to eat and they'll start resuming their normal winter feeding habits, whatever that is, okay? And, um, I know you have to excuse me because there's a lot of here I'm going to get on. So, um, so now when I get to the stream, be patient. Don't, I, I, you know, I'm sure so many guys who I've just witnessed so many guys get out of their car and they walk right into the stream right over to a honey hole I mean, I it's just it happens so much and you don't realize How many fish they spook, you know, whether it's fish right by the bank whether it's fish five yards off the bank Sometimes the honey hole they're going is out in the middle of this creek I don't care how wide the creek is but you're spooking fish away 
fish your way out to wherever you want to go. But first, when you get there, look at the stream. Analyze the stream. See if you see any, anything going on, any feeding activity, any bug activity. Um, just check the flows, check the clarity of the water. Um, I, then, before you even start fishing, have some type of a strategy. Are you gonna fish upstream? Are you gonna fish downstream? Is it a big river or you, you know, you, you should be breaking it into sections on a big river like the Delaware, like the Lehigh. It, it could even be Penn's Creek, you know, Pine Creek. Break, break those bigger streams into sections. If you can't get across, I under, okay, then, you know, at least you could still fish them as sections as far out as you can go back out go either up or down whichever way you want to go but have a strategy because the best thing you could do is not alert the fish that you're there okay you don't want to alert those fish that you're there because you're just giving away your position you're putting them on guard already not saying you're not going to catch them but you know them not knowing you're there the percentage goes way up if if you know if you're going to catch that fish if he doesn't know you're there okay <laughs> And um, uh, also, as far as sunglasses go, I use amber for sunny days, and then I use yellow for either cloudy or low light conditions early in the morning, towards evening. Um, yellow, you'd be amazed at how good yellow is. And don't ever, ever expect your eyes, uh, don't, don't count on your eyes seeing fish in the water, because those fish just blend in. For every fish you probably see, you probably missed a ton of them because those fish blend into their bottom so well. Don't rely on your eyes to see the fish. Now there's times you can sight fish, okay, when the water's low and clear. And I mean low, like summertime low. But, um, but for the most part, my my glasses aid me more in wading than they do in spotting fish or just seeing my line or leader, okay? So it's not, I don't use it to see fish. Like I said, other than in those rare conditions that you can sight fish, okay? Now, we're gonna talk about wading because guys, guys and their wading. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Wading is so important. Um. Um, as far as wading in the water, I'm going to talk about winter because we're in winter. Okay, where the fish are. Um, first, I already, already told you, you want to fish your way out to any spot you're going. Fish the banks first. Fish wherever you're going to wade first. Even if you're out in your section or where you're working up or down, before you take a few steps upstream, throw one or two casts up there. I've had on video so many times like, Okay, I want to, I'm going to go up that direction. I'm going to cast up a couple times. So many times I've caught a fish right in line with me, whether up or down, because you, you, know, you definitely want to fish any area you're going to walk into, even if you think, oh, there's no fish along the bank. You don't know that, but it doesn't hurt to take at least one or two casts first before you walk up there. You'll probably surprise yourself a lot of times, you know, casting before you walk into an area. And um, uh, there's another saying too, as far as I know, as th this covers you know wading, but it's also fish behavior in the winter. There's an old theory of you have to fish deep, slower pools in the winter. Throw that right out. I don't care what anybody comes back to me and says. Throw that right out the window, <laughs> okay? Because I I I never went by that. I fish the exact, and I mean the exact same water, summer, winter, fall, spring, exact same water. I do not try to pick out slow, slower, deeper pools. It, it, those fish are where the food are, and where the food is, is where the bugs are, and the bugs are usually more so in faster water than they are in the slower water. There's a lot of fish, and a lot of bugs in the slower water, but you go back and check all my winter videos in every single one of my winter videos i will i will almost guarantee you i am fishing in fast fast shallow rifts deep rifts 
the same exact order. Don't ask me why they're there, other than I'm just going to tell you there's food there, and they're, they're not there, you know, they're there because there's food there, okay? And um, so don't be focusing on slow, deep water in the winter. Uh, you can catch just as many, if not more, fish fishing the exact same water you fish the other, all the other seasons, okay? Now, uh, waiting, like I said, have a strategy. And sometimes that strategy, or oftentimes, if you go into a crowded stream, it's dictated by the other anglers. So, yeah, everybody ideally would like to fish upstream because you think you're coming from behind the fish. But if there's guys upstream, you got to fish downstream. So you have to learn to fish downstream. And um, actually, when I'm catching, and you guys see I catch a lot of fish on the swing and the hang, that's the way I like to go because the swing and the hang are the last part of my drift. And it's if you're working upstream, I've already disturbed the water downstream. So I don't expect to get hits on the swing and the hang. But if, uh, like if you're using streamers or if you're using um, uh, soft tackles and you're swinging, you're obviously, but I, I use the swing and the hang even on my nymphing drifts. And if, for, if that day I'm getting a lot of hits on the swing and the hang, I'm working downstream. And <laughs> so, so, um, and, and, you know, I don't ever test mother nature, you know, wade, whatever you're comfortable with, even if, even if there's, um, fish rising to an area you can't reach. Now, with that said, and you've seen in some of my Delaware videos, I'm going to reference them more because of these conditions come up more as far as wading goes there's areas I can't get to and you can learn there is something about this learning how to long distance nymph okay if you're just I'm going to just say you're a nymph and not putting down anything but a lot of high sticking euro type nymphing is more close quarters it's not really long distance yes some guys can get some longer cast out there but more so it's a it's a, um it's a close closer method of nymphing okay but there's times i can't get out to an area and i just you know i've termed some of them hail mary casts or whatever um or just my regular long i'm very very comfortable nymphing at 60 feet okay i never ever look for the perfect drift I never look for the perfect drag free drift. I look for a drift that's just good enough to get that fish to come over and hit my bugs. Okay? So if I get drag free drifts, I get them. If I don't get them, I don't get them and I don't sweat it because I cast differently than most normal nymphers that might go 45 degrees up, 45 degrees down, and that's their sweet spot. I go way upstream. I manage my slack line down and then I let it go through the swing and the hang. So my strike zone or my target area is much longer and um, I'm very just comfortable with managing my slack line and getting the best drift that I can, not the perfect drift. So uh, I just don't, you know, <laughs> I just, I, I don't ever, I was never like that. I mean, yeah in the ideal position and the ideal flow and the ideal everything yeah i will get a nice drag free drift and probably most of my drifts are a nice perfect drift but probably a large uh a large amount of my drifts are under some type of drag you can make that drag work work for you whether it's usually with streamer fishing or wet fly fishing or swinging that you, your your fly or your rig is 100% under drag. So <laughs> you might as well w go with it and work with it, uh, whether they're taking it as a merging bug or whether they just take it. We don't know why they take it all the time. But there's just days where just the swing and the hang, may not, when I mean hang, at the end of my hang, when they're hitting on the hang, I will let that thing hang down there. Sometimes, most of the time for at least three to five seconds, sometimes up to 10 seconds and so many to and don't pinch your line don't pinch it because they're going to hook themselves as soon as they as soon as they bite your fly you just have it set and i just see that line ever so slightly move 
move, do something. And all I do is lift my wrist. All I do is lift my wrist and boom, I got him. And like I said, because they hitting it on the swing and the hang, most times they're gonna hook themselves. Okay, so I told you about reading water, told you about sunglasses, and go long, slow, waiting. Um, and I don't use a waiting staff on some rivers like the Never Sink, I will. I should probably use them in Penn's Creek, but I just don't. But there's gonna come a time when I'm going to have to use a waiting staff. So, you know, if you need a waiting staff, make sure you take the waiting staff. Um, uh, okay, so let me flip over my outline here. Okay. And well, now we're gonna talk about my technique. And this is, like I said, I'm not gonna put down anybody's way of doing it. It's successful for you, go for it. I'm gonna explain to you what I do and why I do what I do. <laughs> Okay, so my technique, okay? My technique and how I approach fly fishing is all about simplicity. Just simple, 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 okay? So most of the time, or on all my rigs, all I have is weight forward floating line. Um, well, this last rig, I did get a double taper floating, but let's just say floating line, okay? Uh, traditional, just fly line. Okay, and then I have my 50 foot, 50, 50 foot, 50 inch cutthroat for a leader. I promote cutthroat because that's the brand that I like, but furled leaders in general, I like them. They hold absolutely no memory. They turn over my fly great. They have no stretch to them. So I like them, but I also, in my fanny pack, have backup all mono tapered rigs just in case something happens. You can still use all mono or all fluoro tapered. You can make your own rigs up. A lot of guys do that. Um, but I I like using the furl leader. I have nothing. It just has uh, performed just super well for me. So that's what I use. Off of that, I usually have... Uh, on a bigger stream. Now we'll just talk about like Penn's Creek size, Little J size, Delaware size, Pine Creek size. Um, I usually have five feet of 4X fluoro and then my tandem rig, okay? If I'm going for drives, I'll still have five feet of 4X fluoro and then I'll put three more feet of either 5X or 6X, whatever I'm going with for drives that day, put my dry fly on, go fishing. I don't care at all about sag. I don't care at all about if my cutthroat leader sinks a little. It is all minuscule, <laughs> insignificant as far as your drift and presentation go. I don't care about the sag. I know I know competitions guys. That's what they're into. But you know what? They're competitive fly fishers. I'm not a competitive fly fisherman. I don't have to be like them. I don't have to fish under those kind of conditions. I don't try to emulate them and do that uh, type of fishing, okay? I still see my hit. I still set the hook. I there There is, whether I'm focusing on the belly of my line, whether I'm focusing where the line hits the water, whether I'm seeing down further where the fly line meets my furled leader, I see enough in it where I pick up the hit and I still set the hook and, and catch most of my fish, okay? Yeah, you're gonna, everybody misses fish, but that's, that just goes with, I don't care what kind of fishing, you know, technique you're using, okay? And um, uh, when I, I like throwing upstream more so because I don't like to, I like fishing at longer distance, nipping along, because I don't want to alert those fish. I don't like the idea of waiting close to fish. Most of my nymphing you see is out of the, maybe the closest I'll do, eh, I mean on a small stream, yeah, there's sometimes I will cast right on, let it drift right underneath my rod tip, but I have taken several casts before I even get to that spot. So I'm covering area, but for the most part, I like 
I like the fish not knowing that I'm there. So when I cast, I cast pretty far upstream. And like I said, my strike zone is not in a 45 degree angle this way. My strike zone could be like out here, okay? And um, so I have a longer strike zone. Um, I, uh, since I throw up higher, my, my rig has time to get down to the bottom. And I have a longer strike zone. And since I utilize the swing and the hang, that's not my strike zone, but I'm just, that's actually a lazy way of fishing. Letting it go through the swing and the hang, your rig is already in the water. Why not just up your odds, let, let it go through the swing and the hang, and <laughs> you'd be amazed at how many fish you might catch instead of pulling it out and just casting back up again on a 45 degree angle. Okay, so, um, it, it's, I say that this to one guy, it's just a numbers game. You're just increasing your odds and opening up a longer strike zone for you to, to get a hit um, okay and when I'm fishing I I don't fish with ciders even though some of my stuff has ciders on them or something to call a cider but I don't focus on that cider because a cider is stationary okay so if you have your cider at a certain point in your leader and you throw up to six to eight inch riff and it comes down and drops down to a foot and a half or two foot of water that cider might still be useful at a certain distance but at a further distance some of that cider is going to be underwater i don't know if you could see it or not but i don't like a stationary cider okay what i what i focus on uh if you're using adjustable indicators like you know thingamabobbers or air thingamabobbers or airstrike indicators Anything that you can adjust, you have to be diligent and adjust that for the varying depths. But for the most part, that even, that that indicator is not as accurate in reading a hit when you're throwing up to eight inches and now you're down into two, two and a half feet if it's a drop-off pool. So me, without an indic if I'm not focusing on an indicator or a cider, I'm just using my whole line, my whole leader I can adjust my focal point as it's coming down, whether it's whether it's skinny water or now I'm into the deeper end of the pool. I can adjust my focal point myself, okay? And when my rig's coming down and I'm hitting deeper water, sometimes I will purposely try to slow up my drift to give my rig an extra second or two to drop down and go down instead of... If, if I don't manipulate my drift in some way, instead of going down, it's also my rig's gonna come into me. And most times that's what happens with everybody's drift is your, your drift more, more times than not does not go straight down the middle of the, of the stream. It slightly comes into you. But you have to take that into account on your next on your next cast as you're as you're going through work in that area you have to know that your drift is not usually going straight down it's it's slightly coming into you so just be aware of that whatever method you're doing because that's more so what happens most of the time than then then you know more so it doesn't go like i said straight down um uh and let me see focus okay i got to, I told you where i focus and like i said i cast higher because i don't spook the fish and that is one of the best things for like i said not not to up in your chances of getting that if you don't spook a fish and that fish doesn't know you're there most times the first good drift by that fish boom he will take it maybe the second or third but for the most part if you, that fish is not alert that you are there, and I don't care what fly you're using, if it's presented the right way, that fish will go and take it, uh, will probably take that, that fly if he is not on the alert, okay? Um, now, as far as fighting fish, I can't say I see a lot of guys doing this, but I see enough to where I feel like I have to say something. There are guys that every fish they catch they're walking around the stream, they're fighting the fish, they're, and it could be a, be a 10, 12 inch fish, and they're fighting it like it's a 20 inch. 
learn to hold your position because the last thing you wanted to do is disturb all that water around you for one fish now okay if you got a monster on it you got a trophy fish on it that's different that's an extreme okay but for the most part we're going to talk the average fish from let's say 10 inches up to 14 inches hold your position fight your fish set your drag properly okay if you're unsure about your drag set it more so on the lighter side versus the tighter side and never 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 pull line out of your reel to give the fish line the the fighter to pull off that's what your drag is for and then like i said if you're unsure set it on the lighter side um because i i see guys i'm not gonna say a lot of guys not but i see guys they're fighting the fish and then they're pulling line out and giving the fish because he wants to run well why you can't do it smoother than your than then your your drag if you have a decent drag or, or just an average drag set that loon set your drag light enough and let the fish pull line out and then when he eases up reel in that line most of the time the the fish uh you can use the pumping reel pump and reel but if he lets you just keep reel 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 him up is the last thing you want is to fight the fish to exhaustion and get that fish in as quick, quick as possible and off off as possible uh, quick get him off as quick as possible um i've you know i i lose a fair number of fish while i'm fighting them and if you know what for me this is me in particular because i'm telling you what i do my high comes from boy when i make that hook set and the first few seconds of the fight i'm good with i'm good with that yeah, if it's a bigger fish or if I'm doing a video for you guys in the video, yeah, I would love to, to land the fish. But for the most part, if he gets off, that's fine. It's totally fine. I'm releasing him anyhow. And, you know, there's more fish to be caught. So, yeah, yeah, but, you know, yeah, I understand if it's a big fish. Yeah, yeah everyone wants to see it or take a picture or whatever, you know. But, but uh, I try to land the fish as fast as I can. You know in, in my earlier years my first three years i used to try to like uh preach to get that fish in under a minute like 30 seconds to a minute but i know that's not you know up in the delaware i can't do that if it's and don't when you're fighting the fish there's guys who say don't let that fish get downstream of you because then the hook's facing i mean you don't know when you hook that fish you do not know where that hook is on that fish if it's on bottom lip top lip corner of his mouth you don't know and there's no way you're ever going to outrun a fish to, <laughs> to, to not stop him from getting downstream if he wants to go downstream he's going to get downstream in seconds and you're going to kill yourself trying to <laughs> stop him um uh, you know trying to what, run downstream or do something to uh, to to keep him upstream you don't worry about that fight the fish you land them you land them if he gets off he gets off i mean hopefully i'm talking to most you guys who are catch and release fishermen but don't don't run around the stream disturbing the water hurting yourself trying to trying to uh, land the fish it's just <laughs> hold your position fight that fish you dictate the fight don't let the fish dictate the fight when I say dictate the fish, if he's got his nose down, and he's dictating the fight. But if you got his nose up, and more so, if he breaks the surface, man, drag that fish across the top of the water if you can. Because uh, once his nose breaks the surface, he's almost helpless. Yeah, he can still flop around, he can break it, he, things can happen, but for the most part, he, he's at his most vulnerable when his nose breaks the surface. And his nose breaks the surface, uh, and you can do this while you're fighting. You, can, you have to have a fighting strategy and having enough line. Most guys don't bring in enough line, and what they do is they bring their rod up high, 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 and they're trying to reach out as far as they can. Instead of reaching up high, bring that rod behind you. Bring it up, and then bring it behind you, and then long as you have a short enough line now you brought in enough you'll drag that fish on the top of the water right into your net okay but most guys don't bring in enough line and then instead of bringing the rod behind their head they bring the rod up 
and they're stretching up real high and they're reaching down and they're <laughs> it's like they're scissoring themselves <laughs> because one stretched out that way one stretched out that way and so try to be aware of that okay um let me excuse me I'm trying to get my outline here again and um okay and and this i guess i'm going to talk about equipment last and and but i want to make this thing like i said about simplicity keep it simple my method or way that i fish i think is very simple okay i love fly line i love the, the control i have with fly line i like the artistry of casting fly line it's just you have so much more control i can line drive i can fish long distances you know as far as when dry fly fishing goes there's no other substitute for fly line when it comes to dry fly fishing yes there are substitutes in nymphing but it, i i still think um fly line has all the advantages over everything i'm not, not talking about your leader i'm just talking about your fly line your main your main line there's so much control with fly line just for how it's built and how it you know your fly line delivers your fly it's not like in your own nymphing it's your fly the weight of your fly is learning how to tuck cast or learning how to use the weight of the flies to cast your line and your leader out there so that's just how i was brought up that's more the traditional way that fly line delivers your fly out to the fish okay and um uh, I, I mentioned the tuck cast. I never, I still to this day, I understand what the tuck, the, the, the un, I understand what the tuck cast is supposed to do. But I never understood why focus and try to get, why do even a tuck cast when you could just cast upstream three more feet. And your fly will be down instead of trying to drive your flies down and force them down at this particular point right then and there why not i have never ever ever been in a position where i just couldn't cast up a little higher i just just cast up a little higher and your fly will come down using whatever method you want to use to cast the fly whether you want to use a water load cast or whether you want to use you know you want to lob it whether you want to use a roll cast but if you cast up higher and you want that fly down the bottom in that particular spot, why use the tuck cast and cast right into that spot and sink the sink it real fast? I mean, I know they'll say, well, they want to get tight to the fast fish and tight to your rig real Well, what's the difference in casting up three feet higher or whatever distance higher? Because you might catch a fish up there too. You might catch a fish three feet up higher. But so you give it two or three seconds to get down and it's down at that depth anyhow so i know i'm probably i'm going to hear some comments about that but i never understood why you need a cast a specific cast to get your flies down into a certain spot that you want i understand what the tuck cast does and you know the theory behind it driving your flies down in but i don't see why that's necessary why you have to do that I, just cast up a little higher <laughs> so um and uh so now i'm going to talk about equipment i made this statement earlier in this that you know equipment to me i'm not going to say it's the least important thing because it's not but it's not as important as your approach your technique your waiting reading the water your research before you go out that stuff is is more important than what how expensive the rod you're using what length of rod you're using it it it, it just is that is way more important than your equipment okay now you're for a nympher yes longer rods do help in line control that's the name of the game in nymphant is line control so it does help in line control but with practice you get proficient with whatever method you're using 
you could learn to use just about any rod. I have used seven and a half, eight and a half, nine, 10, 11, and 11 and a half foot rods, and I have caught fish with all of them nymphing. And, and usually rod length, you know, 10 and 11 are pretty much nymph specific rods. 10 foot is a very is a compromising length for people who want to nymph and dry fly fish okay even nine foot you can go nine nine and a half ten they're very compromising lengths 11 foot you're going out to just pretty much nymphing okay you can i've dry fly fish with 11 foot but it's idea it's not ideal but i can make it work but it's not ideal to me the ideal dry fly rod is a nine foot rod that is the most ideal accurate rod it just works for you it can for the average distance that you cast for accuracy nine foot is a beautiful dry fly length for a rod okay 10 foot like i said is a good compromise for nymphing and dry fly 11 foot nymphing now once you get under nine foot the eight and a half seven and a half six foot six and a half foot rods those are all stream specific rods okay because your little streams little brookie streams little wild streams you're working in tight quarters and you can't take 10 11 foot rods in there sometimes not even nine sometimes not even eight and a half so if you are a type of person who fishes all like i fish all kinds of waters mostly bigger but i do fish a lot of smaller streams so that i do have smaller rods for those stream specific rods for those smaller streams okay you will just you'll have a happier day out there if you have a if you have a comfortable rod that you can get you know and work around the smaller streams um uh that is about it guys uh one thing i want to say is you know i mentioned like your attitude and just keeping everything simple and i'll talk just a little bit about stream etiquette if you see guys below you you're going to be fishing close to them i'm a social guy i talk to people i know there's guys who like to be by themselves but that falls on you if you want to be by yourself you have to put yourself in the position you can't control other people and you can't expect people to have the same etiquette as you so that is something i i think guys put on themselves if you want to be by yourself you have to put yourself in that position to fish by yourself um but if other guys are there um or other guys come onto you to come up to you start fishing around you you can either socialize or not socialize but you can just accept it and get along with your day and have a good outing no matter what happens or you can have a blow up and you could ruin your day you can put a damper on your day that you the only person you can control is you you can't control other people you can't expect people to have your same kind of etiquette um so some of that falls on the fisherman now, as far as there, there is, you know, great things. I have so many good stories about just being social with guys and talking and, and passing on things. And that doesn't mean you have to be best buddies and fish together the rest of the day. You say hi, you get along, you know, you talk chit chat for a second. But if there's guys there before you get there, I think the most important thing is if, if, if you're, if you want to fish a certain way and there's a guy there, just stop and say, hey buddy, are you, are you going upstream or downstream? Just to find out which way he's working. And if he is working the same direction you want to go, etiquette is give him a, a fair distance to so he can continue down. You know, like, like I, and, and that's also stream specific because that can change with a regular stock stream. But, you know, let's say I'm, you know, I can't even say because... Every, it's all different um all i could say is if if i'm going downstream i say hey buddy you, you know you're going downstream or i just just want to know and he says yeah i'm going to say okay i'm gonna i'll go down about 100 yards and i uh, you know um or i might go down a 10 minute walk whatever that distance is you know just to give him 
a bigger spot to fish. I don't want to go 20 yards down from. I don't want to go 30 yards down from. I know that changes because opening day, guys fish right next to each other. So I'm going to just talk under regular fly fishing etiquette. You know, usually guys who fly fish have a different type of uh, safe space, you know, that they want around them. So, um, or if you have the option, go the opposite. Go If he's going downstream, you know, then you got to go upstream or just go in a different direction. Um, so, you know, uh, the, like I said, everybody's in control of their own attitude, behaviors. Don't think to expect that of other people. The most you can do is be social, talk to them, ask them a question, be polite, and that'll go a lot further than having an argument with the guy. So maybe I'll just end it on that note right there, guys. I hope you liked it. This is just what I do. Everybody, it is not, this is, like I said, you see what I do. A lot of guys ask me questions and want to know what I do so I that's just what I wanted to see show you how I go about picking a stream pick, looking at researching numerous streams before I make a choice checking flows checking the weather checking the wind checking the temperature um, before I make my decision of where I want to go um, and then I spoke a little bit about my technique. You know, if you want to go and check my summer video of my, uh, I made a summer video called my leader setup. That goes into my leader, how I switch over from Nymphin to Dries, back over to Nymphin. I have, I like my Nymphin Strategies 3, part 3. Nymphin Strategies part 3, the best as far as looking at my technique. And, um, and if you have any questions here, just ask me more questions here. Um, I, like I said, I, you're, you're a Nymph and Mono guy, go for it. You know, do, become proficient with whatever method you choose and have fun fishing and share. I, I, I like sharing my knowledge, my experiences, my flies, my whatever. And, you know, there's strength in numbers. You know, I know fly fishing has taken off the last... 10 20 years that has really taken off but uh we probably wouldn't be where we are if it didn't take off because uh, keeping everything a secret is not the way to go either um so um i hope you guys liked it okay if you liked it please give it a thumbs up and i'll see you guys out on the stream okay thank you bye-bye